The Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why not lift your hands to Jesus? Give him praise today. Give him glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We give you glory. We give you praise. We bless your holy and we bless your majestic name. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Father, for your good. Your mercies endure forever. Thank you for what you're set to do in these days. Thank you, Lord, because in these days, our lives will be changed. Thank you because we are coming higher and we are going deeper. Father, we give you praise. Thank you because all that is in your heart for these meetings, we call them fully discharged and accomplished in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen, church. Good evening. And, uh, well, <laughs> how do I do this? Good evening. And uh, it's a joy to be here. I want to thank Pastor for this privilege and for this opportunity given to me to speak at this seminar. I count it a great honor and uh, I'm humbled by the honor given to me to bring the word of God to us in this edition and installment of Makaira Moments. One thing I can tell you is that your life is in for a great time. You are in for a great time in these meetings. God told me as I was praying and preparing that these will be days of light, glory, realignment, and proper and better positioning. As a result of these days, many of my people will walk in new levels of revelation, illumination, and glory, and great grace will be upon their heads. The depths of the life in Christ that many have heard of and yearned for will become a constant lifestyle, your new normal, says God. Many will step into the rest of faith that only revelation brings. Get ready to fly higher and go deeper. God says spiritual things will become more real and palpable to you, and natural things, natural things, situations and problems will wane in, their influ in the influence they wield over you. With the truth that my word brings to you, you will be ushered into a realm of new possibilities. Amen. If you believe that, lift your hands and receive God's word. Amen. Amen. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory. Amen. So, how many of you are ready? Yeah. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, we're studying the prayers of Paul or Paul's prayers. Paul's prayers can be found in the epistles, of course, Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 23, then Ephesians chapter 3, 14 to 21, Philippians 1, 9 to 11, Colossians 1, 9 to 11, and then 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 to 12. I'll take it again. Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, Philippians 1, 9 to 11, Colossians 1, 9 to 11, and 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 to 12. All right? And in this seminar, I'll be dealing with the first four. I will leave out Thessalonians for, uh, there is no time to get into that. So we'll be looking at Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. That is Paul's first prayer for the Ephesians. That's what we'll look at today. We'll look at Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. That's tomorrow. Philippians 1, 9 to 11 on Saturday. And Colossians 1, 9 to 11 on Sunday. These are Paul's prayers. When you heard the title of this seminar, you may have asked, Paul's prayers. Why Paul's prayers? Well, in discussing this, what we'll be doing is that we'll be looking at the major prayers of Paul. I've given us five citations now, but these are not the only places where Paul prayed. In fact, virtually in every book, he prayed in every letter and epistle he wrote, he prayed for the saints. But we call them major. I call them major prayers because they are located at the beginning of the book 
or like, or at the end or the introduction to a new segment or section in the book, like the prayer we have in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. The first, the book can be divided into two parts, Ephesians 1 to 3 and then 4 to 6. So at the beginning, he prayed a prayer and then as because in those first three chapters, he really dealt with the believer's position. In the second segment, he dealt with the believer's walk. So when he's summarizing the believer's position, he wrapped that up in from verse 14 to 21 of Ephesians chapter 3. Otherwise, all of these prayers are located at the beginning of the books. But there are other prayers Paul prayed. Philemon 6. Paul said, I pray that the communication of your faith might become effectual. That's another prayer of Paul. But we are not looking at that. We are looking at these major prayers of Paul. And so let me just read Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, which we are going to be looking at today. And we'll take off from there. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. All right. So before I go into Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, the first prayer, I want to give what I want to call preliminaries to the prayer of Paul. Because like I said at the beginning, uh, some seconds ago, somebody may be asking, why are we talking about Paul's prayers? What is the importance about, of Paul's prayers? Why not Moses' prayers? Why not even Jesus' prayer? Are we putting Paul on a pedestal uh, 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 that we are not giving to other people? Why Paul's prayers? Well, first of all, why not Paul's prayers? Let me give you a bit of Paul's credentials. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. When somebody writes two-thirds of the New Testament, is such a person to be taken seriously Talk to me, church. Would, would you agree that you should take somebody, that person serious? If you're looking at any biblical theme, you'll ask, what does the Old Testament say? And then you'll come to the New Testament. You'll ask, what did Jesus say? The next person you are going to ask, most likely, is what did Paul say? You may not say, what did James say? You may not say, what did Jude say? You are, but you are definitely, on any theme, you will ask, did Paul say anything? He may be silent, but it, it will, it, it, it's likely that a person who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament will have something to say. Not only that, more importantly, this is the man to whom the mainstay of revelation of the church was committed into his hands. Paul said, Paul called the gospel, my gospel. No other person spoke like that. Paul spoke so authoritatively that if you don't understand the position he held, you may probably think he was proud. He said in Colossians, to me, it was given to fulfill the word of God. That literally means to complete the word of God. It means that without the Pauline revelation, if we had the Bible and we didn't have Romans to... Uh, Romans to Philemon. Hebrews is contended, so let us stay with Romans to Philemon. If we didn't have that bulk of those portions of Scripture, the Word of God will not be complete. Somebody says, oh, Pastor, shall I, if we take any book out of the canon of Scripture, it will be incomplete. Well, it will be incomplete, but your life will still be good. I'm sorry, I don't want to denigrate any person, but if you take Esther out of the Bible, apologies to those bearing Esther, but if you take Esther out of the Bible, it will not kill your life. But if you take Romans out of the Bible, are you following me now? Think of taking Ephesians out of the Bible. Colossians, you're in trouble, man. 
Not with these charlatans going around town preaching things that Paul answered for us. That is why you must know Paul. Paul must be your very good friend. Can you, have, can you say a good amen? So that's why we're looking at the prayers of Paul because of how important Paul is. Now, the basis of these prayers, if you look at our text, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul said in verse 15, Therefore I also, after I heard of your two things, faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Say faith. Say love. You will find this statement or similar statements repeated in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, 7 or 8, Paul talked about Epaphras who declared to us your love in the spirit. We therefore having heard, we began to pray. Paul says, if you read in Philippians chapter 1, being, very, being confident of this very thing, that he who has started the good work will complete it on the, till the day of Jesus Christ. On that, those bases, Paul gives an introduction, and upon that introduction, he says, when I heard of your faith, when I heard of your love, when I heard of the good work that God commenced in you, I hit my knees and I started praying for you. What does this tell you? It tells you that these prayers are to be prayed for everybody who is born again. Because faith and love are the birthmarks of salvation. The birthmarks of salvation. Most of us have birthmarks and they appear in different places. Everybody's birthmark in most cases is unique to them. Am I correct? But listen, in the family of God, all of us have the same birthmarks and they are unique, and, sorry, and they look the same way. Faith and love. When you get born again, what does God give to you? The measure of faith. When you get born again, what does God give to you? His love. So when Paul mentions faith and love, he said, the moment I heard of your salvation, paraphrasing, in Christ, I began to pray for you that God would do this, that God would do this. And this answers a question for us. Many times Christians are asking, you know, I got somebody saved. Now that they are saved, what should happen for, to them? How should I pray for them? Or you, or you may be hearing, listening to me today on Greenville here or watching online and you just got born again and you want to say, how do I pray for myself? How do I grow spiritually? How do I develop? How do I appreciate? Well, you can take a cue from Paul because Paul said, after I heard of your faith, in other words, the moment you came to faith in Christ Jesus, the moment you were saved, you got born again, the next thing I began to do for you was that I began to pray these prayers for you. So if you've been saved for a while, but you've never prayed Paul's prayers, I challenge you, begin to pray them right now. Begin to pray Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 23, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, and all the other prayers. Begin to pray them, and you will find out that it will accelerate and it will accentuate your spiritual growth. Can you say a good amen? amen. Notice also that these prayers are samples of constant prayers. They are samples or they are examples of praying constantly. You know, sometimes you've read in the Bible where it tells us pray without ceasing. Who has read that before? All through the New Testament, pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6, 18, pray with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching with all perseverance for the saints. Perseverance and supplication for the saints. So we are to pray always. How many of you have tried to pray Pray always, but you didn't know what to pray for. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, praying always is a... You will not pray always. It will be difficult, an uphill task, which is likely going to be, take the energy of the flesh for you, from you. Apart from that, you may not even know what exactly to pray for. Are you following? So one way to pray always... Remember what Paul said, I pray these prayers for you constantly, always, always, always. What does this tell you? You can never go wrong praying the Pauline prayers. Never, ever, never, ever. There will be some periods of time in your life where you should intensify these prayers. I prayed these prayers some years ago when I stumbled. I actually stumbled upon this. I didn't read it before. Nobody had told me about it. It was one of those things the Spirit of God just revealed to me. I was in university then. We were having a prayer meeting uh, on Sunday. We normally didn't have prayer meetings. But the pastor called for a prayer meeting. And so if you, went to, if you know my school, Ife, 
We have a sports complex, which is better known as a prayer center, actually, because that's what we do there. That's the main thing that happens there. And so we're having it in the, in the lawn tennis court. So I got there earlier on, and I used to carry my New Testament with me. You know, uh, I wore out many of those New Testament, Gideons, those small ones. And as I got there, I, the spirit, I was just led. I didn't know. I just, I've been reading the epistles a lot. So that, those places just jumped out at me. And I started reading them. I was praying that prayer just before we had the prayer meeting. And interestingly, when the pastor came, guess what he told us to pray? Paul's prayers. That's the first time. It was later on I read Kenneth Hagin who talked about Paul's prayers and E.W. Kenyon about Paul's prayers. And I observed that in my own life, when I prayed this prayer, things changed for me. Revelation knowledge, divine enablement, divine ability, it took me to another level. There are times in your life where you need to intensify on these prayers. And as we go on, I will show you areas where you need to intensify on. But these are prayers that you can pray for yourself every time. I have a prayer, I have a prayer page and folder in my phone where I use, which, which I, uh, I use in praying. Anytime I want to pray, generally speaking, I'll just open and my major prayer thoughts and points are there. The first sets of prayers I have are the prayers of Paul. Because till today, those prayers are necessary. If you want to appreciate spiritually, if you want to develop spiritually, one thing that will accentuate, accelerate, and make your growth go to high levels is by praying these prayers. And you pray them all the time. Father, I pray for myself that you grant unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ. Cause the eyes of my understanding to be enlightened that, you, uh, that I may know the hope to which I'm called and so forth. And you pray that. And you pray it. You pray today. You pray two months later. There are periods of time you double down on them and you pray them. There are prayers that you can and you should pray Always. Can you say amen? amen? Notice this also. They are spirit-inspired prayers. They are spirit-inspired prayers. Any prayer that God hears and answers, there are two things that must co coexist. They are basically the same thing. They are di different sides of the same coin. Number one, they must be according to his will. And number two, they must be prayed in the spirit. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 6, 18... Praying always with all prayer and supplication in what? The spirit. All prayers must be in the spirit. Now, in the spirit, sometimes will include speaking in tongues. Not in every occasion. Now, when somebody is praying by the spirit of God, let me ask you, who is conversing? Prayer is between you and God, right? So it is your spirit praying to God, your heart talking to God. But what does Paul say in Romans chapter 8? He says, he who knows, he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because he, that is he who knows, uh, uh, he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In simple English, what that verse is saying is that prayer, when the Holy Spirit gets involved in prayer, he's conversing through your spirit to God. So it is, in another sense, it is a conversation between God. God learn, using God the Spirit, who indwells your spirit, making use of your tongue and making, communicating to God. This is what happens. The Holy Spirit knows, it's like, pastor is the father and the spirit. <laughs> Illustration. I know what is in pastor's mind. This is the rule in prayer. You must pray to God the will of God. The one who knows the will of God is God and the Spirit. So Pastor Tayo is praying. So I am the Spirit. I am giving Pastor Tayo expo, cronje. Because I, the Spirit, know what is in the mind of the Father. The Father knows what is in the mind of the Spirit. We are one. So I give Pastor Tayo the expo and she prays it to the Father. It's like open book exam. And there is no other, God has no choice but to answer that prayer. Why? Because God's rule is that if I'm going to answer a prayer, it must be according to my will. And no man apart from the help of the Spirit knows the mind of God. So the Holy Spirit empowers my spirit, gives me an utterance based, coded in the mind of God, 
puts it in that utterance and I speak it to God. God hears his word. God hears his will and he says, I exalt my, my word above everything and he brings it to pass. What does this tell me? When Paul was praying this prayer, not only did he pray it, God gave him what he was praying. And Paul was careful to write it down for us. Many of, let me explain. When Pastor Apostle Faithman came, he said, he, Pastor in the second service, when introducing him, said something Apostle Faithman does. That when Pastor is praying, after a while, he'll bring out his what? How many of you are here? Bring out his phone, put it down, and record. What, did he, what does he recognize? He recognized, recognizes that these words are not just mere words. This is the mind of God being prayed. This is the will of God being communicated. So he, he, he can't write it, so he records it, goes back with it, and he's hearing revelation given to him by the Spirit of God, which came in the place of prayer. Anybody following my trend of thought? So when Paul prayed these prayers in the Spirit, he's revealing to us what is the mind of God. He put it down for us. He wrote it down. Paul could have told them, hasn't somebody told you before, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Well, that helps you if you know, well, if, if you know the person prays well. But when a person tells you, I'm praying for you, and tells you what they were led to pray for ab about, who realizes that that takes it a notch higher? Because now you have insight. You now even have something you yourself can pray or you yourself can declare, you yourself can stand in faith for and expect. That is what Paul did here. He said, I got this by the Spirit of God, and I prayed it out for you guys, and I'm letting you know that this is what I prayed. If somebody can invest in prayer, in your, for, invest in prayer for you, what does that tell you? It tells you that you should do the same thing and much more. So these are not prayers that say, oh, the... the Look, the person responsible for your prayer life is you. Primarily. Primarily. Did you get that? Did you get that? Have a prayer life for yourself. Don't look for those people who look for people to pray. If you want to fast, fast for yourself. Don't commercialize fasting. Don't do like those fake, yeah, yeah, false prophets. Now, there are these churches where they say they, they are not even churches. They say goat is or cow is starving and fasting for them. No, have your own prayer life. I said, have your own prayer life. Develop your own prayer life. So if Paul is praying these prayers for them, then it behoves us that we should pray them for ourselves. Write this down. In these prayers, God is giving us a peek into his mind concerning us. What he has accomplished for us, what he desires for us. In this prayer, God is giving us a peek into his mind concerning us. He's showing us what he has accomplished for us. His desires for us. What he wants us to know. What he has accomplished for us. What his desires for us. What are his desires for us? What he wants us to know. Listen. Listen and what he wants to see accomplished in our lives. Did we get that? Should I take it again? In these prayers, God is giving us a peek into his mind concerning us, showing us what he has accomplished for us, what he desires for us, what he wants us to know, and what he wants to see accomplished. Okay? So you pray these prayers for yourself, and anyone who stands in any position of spiritual leadership. Did you get the quote? Should I take it again? Okay, are we good? Anyone who stands in a position of leadership, pastor, leader, follow-up, mentor, evangelism department, if you're in a position where you bring people to Christ, in fact, each and every one of us should be mentoring people and discipling them. One of the things you can do to watch over the people you are responsible for is to pray these prayers for them. Say, Father, I pray for John who just came to salvation. Now that he's saved, 
Thank you for your faith and love in him. I ask that you give him the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that his love may abound yet more and more. I pray, Father, that he will be flooded with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Things will begin to happen in the life of that person unknown to them. Things they will call coincidences, they will not be coincidences, they will be as a result of those prayers. So, let's start with Paul's first prayer. So, write this down. Paul's first prayer for the Ephesians, dash, a prayer for spiritual enlightenment. A prayer for spiritual enlightenment. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 19. Ephesians 1, 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, or the glorious Father, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and so forth. All right, I'll be focusing today on verse 17 and verse 18. So Paul says there, he prayed for two things. Notice this, two things which are basically the same thing. In verse 17, he prayed that God may give to them the spirit of wisdom. Say spirit of wisdom. And revelation, good, in the knowledge of him. And then verse 18, put up verse 18 please, which is still the same prayer, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So Paul is saying that when God gives you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of him, what happens? The eyes of your understanding are enlightened and you know the result is that you know. So let's start with verse 17, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The first thing I want us to see under this is that this is a gift that God gives. A gift that God gives. Paul prayed that, the God, that God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, may give or grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. May give, he may give it unto you. Now, that word give is in the subjunctive mood in Greek, which simply means it is potential. He didn't say, listen carefully, he didn't say God has given you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He didn't say so. He didn't say, he didn't say now that you're saved, God has given you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He didn't. Are you following me? Are you following me? Yes. He didn't say you have it. You only have it because it's in the subjunctive. That means it is potential. You only have it if it is given to you. That means not every child of God has the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That means not every, not every child of God's eyes of understanding are enlightened. Is that a sobering statement? Because if you are, when you discover what the spirit of wisdom and revelation will do in your life, <laughs> you, you will hit your knees as often as you can till, till this becomes experiential in your life. Paul said that he may give it unto you. Now, it is available to every child of God. That's the good news. But every child of God does not automatically have it. So to possess it, listen... It must be accessed, and to access it, access it, you must request for it. You must ask for it. You must say, Father, give this unto me, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge, in the knowledge of Christ. Give this spirit to me. Cause me to have this spirit. It is when you have it that you now get the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. So for you to receive this, listen, you must first and foremost recognize that you have a need for it. If Paul prayed for it, for you to have it, then you need it. Are you with me tonight? Can you say after me, I need to have the spirit of wisdom. Not everybody's talking. I need, say it after me. I need to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. 
You must, you, you need to have it. So you must first of all recognize your need for it that for you to function maximally, optimally, spiritually, you require it. You cannot be who God wants you to be without this spirit. You cannot. You cannot get into the treasure trove of truth and explore the truths that God gave to us through Paul and the other writers of the Bible, Old Testament and New, listen, without this spirit. You say, but I'm born again, I have the spirit of God. Yes, you're born again. Yes, you have the spirit of God, so you can access it, but automatically you don't have it. If you've never prayed this for yourself, listen, or nobody has prayed it for you, you don't have it. See, the church is busy praying for other things. They are praying, kill my father. Some are even praying for breakthrough. Some are praying for increase. Nothing wrong with that. But listen, this is a prayer that is overarching. This is a prayer that is all encapsulating. This is a prayer that is all subsuming. Because if you pray this prayer, you will get increase. Nay, increase will find you. If you pray this prayer, abundance will haunt you and hound you. <laughs> Glory to God. This is so important as a prayer. You must, re you must discover your need for it. You must ask God for it. You must desire it and you must ask him for it. Listen, spiritual things must be desired. There are some things God gives all of us to start with. Who has realized that? He gives all of us the same thing to start. Say, collect this one, collect this one. All of you, collect this. But there are some things in God you will not receive till you press into it. You didn't hear me. There are some things, the things of the Spirit must be coveted. Paul said, covet the best gifts. Who, who remembers 1 Corinthians 12? That word covet is the same way, where, it's the same word it's, that's used, thou shalt not covet, covet. So you can covet an evil thing. The same word is used in, convert, in convert, coveting spiritual things. A strong desire. A strong desire. Father, give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Cause the eyes of my understanding to be enlightened. You pray today. You come back tomorrow. You keep on praying that prayer. This is a type of prayer that you don't pray and you say, Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, it is done. I receive it by faith. Faith people just like faith, faith and go. No, this is the thing you will pray every day. You will pray for weeks till you begin to see things, till you open the word of God and it just becomes luminous. Things just begin to pop out. You begin to read, five, you want to read 12 verses and you read just five verses and you are stuck. You are stuck. You are saying, what is going on here? No, God has given to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. When it happens, you will know it. You can say I have it, but you don't have it. When it happens, you know spiritual, you know, have you prayed before and you know that one you just did drama? You didn't receive it. Who knows? Who knows that experience? But you know there are times you just close your eyes and you just, 30 seconds, and you say, I have it. I have it. I have it. From sleepless nights, nights to palpable peace. You just know you have it. Not because your physical eyes have seen it, but your heart has made contact and you have received it in the realm of the spirit. That's what happens with this prayer. So it is a gift that God gives. Number two, let us observe three important words here. Three important words. Wisdom, revelation, and knowledge. If you look at verse Verse uh, 17, he says, God may give you the spirit of what? Wisdom. Say wisdom. Say wisdom. Say revelation. And say knowledge. Okay, let's look at those words. That word wisdom here, I'll be a bit fast because of time. So if you don't get everything, I'm sure when you listen to the message, you'll see it. Please, so please understand with me. Uh, the word wisdom there is the Greek word. I don't need to bore you with that. But it refers to, listen higher sense wisdom in a higher sense deep knowledge alright it implies the cultivation of mind and enlightened understanding alright so he's talking about uh, wisdom, a higher form of wisdom uh, wisdom in a higher sense pardon me wisdom in a higher sense 
uh, deep knowledge, moral insight. It implies cultivation of the mind and an enlightened understanding. Now, in the Bible, there are different forms of wisdom. And let me take start from the lowest. There is demonic wisdom, there is earthly or human wisdom, and then there is spiritual wisdom. In fact, James tells us that. He says, this wisdom does not descend from above, but it is uh, earthly, carnal, sensual, and demonic. A lot of people in politics, a lot of people in the business world who, 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 who are shrewd, who do things and, you know, you look at them and say, ah, this man is very sharp. This guy is sharp. This guy knows something. No. He actually has, de- some of them have demonic wisdom. I believe this is the kind of wisdom spoken of in the Old Testament where it talks about God catching the crafty because it's not just human wisdom. There is a human wisdom that God gives everybody, just common sense, you may call it. But Paul was not praying for common sense. Are we on, are we on the same page? Yes. He was praying for spiritual discernment. And listen, I go back to the issue of prayer because here is the thing. As a child of God, you can access the wisdom of God differently. One way you can access the, word, the wisdom of God is through the word of God. Proverbs tells us, for the Lord gives wisdom and out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So the word of God actually contains the wisdom of God. But wisdom is also a gift. What Paul is praying for here is a gift of wisdom. And let me explain. This is not, this is not the gift of the Spirit called the word of wisdom. No. See, eh? Oh my God. There are layers and there are levels of possibilities in God. There are different things available to us. You can access wisdom by studying the word of God. You will get one level of wisdom. You get one level. But there's another level of wisdom, listen, that even makes the word of God come alive to you. That is what Paul is praying for here. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in what? The knowledge that is this wisdom helps you access and activate the knowledge of him. The next word there is revelation. This is a word many of us, are, some of us are familiar with, the word apocalypsis, or in the real Greek text here, apocalypsis here, from the word apocalypsis, which in turn comes from apocalypto. Is this a word many of us are familiar with? And what does apocalypto mean? It means from two words, apo and calypto. Apo, which means the covering. No, sorry, yes. Uh, off. F- yes. Off. From. Yes. From. So see my glass now. This is covering this, right? And that word apocalypto means one meaning is to remove a lid. Or a cover. It's not a perfect example, but in Greek, to the Greek mind, if I redo this, I've apocalyptoed this. So the water is now accessible in the sense that as long as this covering is here, what happens? I cannot access it. I cannot drink it. Another meaning is to remove the veil. I believe our banner is behind here. It's design team people, are you here? <laughs> our legacy service. Now, if you came to church and you, don't, you didn't know about our legacy service and our banner, you'll just say, oh, what a lovely design. But apocalypsis also means to remove a covering or a veil. So there is something behind the veil. Think of this as a veil. There is something behind it. You cannot see it, right? Why? Because it is veiled. It's covered. When you remove the cover, what have you done? You have unveiled, you have brought a revelation. Listen, when Jesus Christ died, when he was buried, when he was raised up from the glory of God the Father, the covering of spiritual truth, which was not known in previous generations, was removed. And in Christ Jesus, there has been an apocalypsis, there has been an uncovering. This prayer is giving you access into the truths that God has uncovered. Like the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, 
uh, the revelation, the mystery, which in previous generations was unknown to the sons of men, but now he's, he's being revealed by his spirit to the holy apostles and the prophets. So in this dispensation now, what we have, the things that God could not reveal in the Old Testament because of the spiritual state of man, because of the spiritual economy and the dispensation of that time, because Jesus Christ hadn't come. Now, because Jesus has come, he's been raised from the dead, he's ascended to heaven. Every truth that God wants his people to know, he has uncovered it through Jesus Christ. Now, he's made it open, and what he now did is that he selected people and downloaded, pardon the expression, conveyed to them this truth, and they wrote it down. When you are reading Paul's writings, when you are reading John's writings, when you are reading your Bible, you are reading revelation knowledge. But in order to access revelation, uh, the knowledge of him, you need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The spirit that accords and uh, that, that agrees with that revelation. I'll explain that in a minute. And the word knowledge, if you're writing, is another word some of us may know. Is epignose. Epignose, from the word epignosis. Epignosis, which means precise or further knowledge. Precise or further knowledge. Thorough acquaintance. This is another translation. True knowledge. True knowledge. Let me read Ephesians 1, 17 to 18 from the Kenneth Woods. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the sphere of a full knowledge of him, the eyes of your heart being in an enlightened state with a view to your knowing what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So Paul is praying for wisdom, the spirit of wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him. Let me say this to you, church. If there is any truth in the word of God that you have struggled with, that you have not easily received, whether it's as a result of wrong teaching or you, 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 you come to church and in all fairness, you are in one of the best churches you can be. You hear the best teachings, some of the best teachings people are privileged and blessed to hear. But you come, you hear it, but you are just struggling with it. It could be a roadblock, a mental block that you have, or they, they are preaching something and you're saying, man, sincerely, I'm not saying this thing pastor is saying. I don't understand it. To help you pray this prayer, if you have a stronghold where it comes to finances, you've heard about giving, but this giving thing, your hand, as it was in the beginning, so it still is now. You've heard about healing. You've heard about direction. You've heard about walking in love. But there are just some truths that appear to be impermeable to you. They don't seep into you. Begin to pray this prayer. Say, Father, I pray, give unto me on this area of money. Give unto me on this area of my relationships. Give unto me in this area of my health. Let me see your word, Father. Let me see what Christ did for me. Grant unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Begin to pray it over and over and over. Something will happen after a period of time. You begin to see it. Oh, from, from, from nowhere, maybe one day in your house, you just say, yay! I got it! I've, I received it! I've, see, I've seen it! Why? Because the eyes of your understanding have now been flooded with light. It's almost like you have a eureka moment. Yeah! And then you begin to see things that you've never seen before. So, let's press this a bit further, this spirit of wisdom and revelation. I want to ask you a question. Paul said God will give to you, the Father will give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What spirit is this? I want us to ask. Look at that. What spirit is this? Is this spirit the gift of the Holy Spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit baptism? That's an important question. Because somebody may be hearing me today and say, but Pastor Shola, I'm born again. My spirit is alive to God. So, you know, 
And you do have a point. Because Jesus said in John chapter 3, that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That word see is the Greek word eido, which means knowledge, intuitive knowledge. So when you get born again, listen, there is actually a level of revelation you come into. But listen, with God, things, like I said, are progressive. There is the salvation revelation level. You begin to see things. But there is a level of revelation you come into when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, which is a higher level. That is why Peter, on the day of Pentecost, after uh, the first sermon on the church age, do you, do you observe how Peter marshaled out scripture? Who was doing that to him? The Holy Spirit that he had been baptized with earlier on that day. If you read places in John, he says the disciples did not understand this, but after Jesus was glorified, they understood. They received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes with revelation, John 14 to 16. But this is different. This is even a notch higher. And the, you see that word spirit there? The word spirit there may give you the impression that it is like your human spirit. So God is giving you like a spirit. That word spirit, you see, we Pentecostals and charismatics, char charismatics, yes. When we hear spirit, everything is Holy Spirit, is Holy Spirit, is spirit. But if you observe your version, the word spirit there is in a, if the New King James is in a small case. Some other translations put a capital S, but I believe that is an extrapolation. Because the definite article in the Greek, whenever you want to know if something is the Holy Spirit, in some instances, not in every instance, the definite article ho is there. This is absent here. In fact, it is better rendered that God will give unto you a spirit. And that spirit is more like a disposition. It is more like, uh, what's another word? Who can, uh, disposition. Uh, attitude. Am I correct? An attitude. Give me a disposition. Why is this important? Many times what blocks us from receiving truth is our attitude. Is our disposition. Anybody with me tonight? What stops us from receiving truth is our attitude, disposition. We are stuck in our ways. We are set in our ways. And except God intervenes, and does some corrective work on our hearts and minds, we will sit under the best messages, sit under the best teach, teachings. That truth will, be, will not penetrate into us. So Paul prayed that God will give you a spirit. And in the New Testament, that word spirit is used in such ways. Write 1 Corinthians 4.21 down. 2 Corinthians 12.18. So that word would mean that God would give you, listen now, an attitude a disposition that makes you receive wisdom, a disposition of wisdom and revelation to access the knowledge of Christ. Should I say that again? A disposition of wisdom that enables you to access a disposition that, uh, of wisdom and revelation that enables you to access the knowledge in Christ. This is something God gives to us. I like to think of it as an endowment or a disbursement of the Spirit. The Spirit of wisdom and revelation is of the Holy Spirit, but it is not necessarily the gift of the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? Do you see the difference? Everything God gives to us, who does it come through? Who does it come through? The Holy Spirit provided for us in Jesus, but coming to us through the person of the spirit. So this disposition, therefore, to what part of the believer does it belong? His spirit or his soul? Spirit or his soul? His soul. His soul. Because when you're born again, your spirit is perfect. Your spirit is set. <laughs> Listen, see, eh? your spirit knows you are a new creation. Your spirit knows you have eternal life. Your spirit knows you are blessed. Your spirit knows you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Your spirit knows you have the faith of God. Your spirit possesses it. The part of you that is struggling is not your spirit. Your spirit is made after God. It resembles God. If your spirit sees God now, it won't say, yeah. It won't. It won't be surprised. If your soul sees God, in fact, it can't stand 
in the presence of God without your spirit, it will, it will struggle. When you hear the word of God on some areas and you're having struggles, is that your spirit or your soul? It's not your spirit. And I'll prove it to you. Sometimes you hear something, something tells you that is true. Ah, that is true. Mm. It'd be like say that thing is true, but something else, another somebody. <laughs> Are you here now? Are you following me? He's telling you, I beg, leave that guy. That guy, he did too excited, excited, see in blackface. <laughs> That's your soul. That's your mind arguing. But one part of you that will witness, that say that thing is true. That's true. That's your spirit. So when Paul prayed for this spirit, he's praying for a spirit, thank you, Lord, that is harmonious, that will, thank you, Lord, that will agree with your spirit. A disposition, let me use that word, that will agree with your spirit, and then you begin to come into this knowledge of God. Write this down. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is an enablement of the Holy Spirit that aids one's ability to see and know spiritual truths. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is an enablement of the Holy Spirit given to one to enable them to see and know spiritual truth. So this knowledge of him is the revelation of Christ that God gave to man and in Paul's context, it would refer to the things that Paul taught in his letters, uh, the things he wrote to us. Now, write this down. This spirit, is not acquired. Let me give it to you again. This spirit is not gotten or acquired by study. Are you following me? Are you still here? Are you here? If you're here, say amen. Good. It is not acquired by, what did I say? By study. Huh. You can study and study and jack and jack and read your Bible, and you don't get anything. In fact, the reason why some people don't read the Bible is because it's not interesting to them. Let me, even, let me take it a step further. You see, a lot of people find it easy, easier to read Samuel, to read Kings, to read Judges, to read, uh, give me those action books, Chronicles, and Messiah lived for 32 years. And in the 32nd year, he killed the enemies at Rabbah. He took the Milo. He did this. He did, hey, see story, see champion. Ah! And as they were approaching, they were seeing, there are people who like those stories. Because as you are seeing it, you are seeing action. You remember that Rambo you, read, you, you just watched? Pshaw, pshaw. Hey, this king was David. You think, of, you read First Samuel 17. And David ran towards Goliath with his sling. Hey, action David. You are watching a movie in your mind. But when you read Ephesians, you say, eh. Or you read Galatians, I marvel that you are moved away. Eh? What, what is you are moved away from another gospel? You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You have redem What is redemption? What are all these theological big, big terms? Who knows what I'm talking about? Who wants to be honest? Who wants to be honest? Then you go back to Genesis. And you now see Jacob stealing from, thiefing from Esau. You see action. You see crossing. Ah, these, these people... And let me take it a step further. Some preachers, that is all they preach. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you cannot read, Pastor C was a master at that, read the Old Testament and bring New Testament realities out. But there are people whose message is only, they don't have any correct New Testament Pauline theology. Therefore, when they are reading and interpreting the Old Testament, it is very dangerous. That's why they come up with all kinds of concocted doctrines. That's why a preacher will read Jonah, you know, Jonah, Jonah, Jonah being swallowed by the will of Nineveh. And say, any will of Nineveh holding your blessing, begin to vomit it now. 
You are laughing, but it happens. I can call the churches. In fact, I shrivel from calling them churches. They read that. They've not read Paul. Because if they read Paul, if they read Colossians, they will find out that you are delivered. There is nothing holding your blessing. There is no, you are blessed. Come on. You are the embodiment of the blessing. You are not darkness. You are light. You cannot be comprehended. You are a mystery. Come on. Come on. Come on. It's easier for them to read all of those pishan, pishan, action scripture. They can even manage the gospels. Hey, Jesus raised the dead. Hey, hey. But when you get into Paul's writings, or you get even into John, that's not even, even John. Ah, ah, these things I write to you. Your fe- our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Eh, what is the meaning of all of that? What's the meaning of all of this? I beg, let's go to action zone. And for 20 years, for 25 years, you've been reading your action zone. What you don't know is that if God opened your eyes, you are immediate in the realm of the spirit. You have not advanced. You have not progressed spiritually. Forget churchianity. Forget church activity. You have not progressed because you have not found the treasure trove and the mainstay of truth, which is these things we are praying about. These truths are so deep that Paul had to pray because he knew that if you just wrote it to them and he didn't back it up with his prayer, they will lose it. So this is like the secret combination that unlocks it, that opens the door. Are you following me, church? It's like going to your door. In, my, in our offices, we use uh, key cards. You want to open the office and you are using a key, kokoro, metal key, to open a... A, 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 a door that opens with a, with a key. That's frustration. That's frustration. And that's the frustration of the church. And when the ministry gifts sadly are in this state, how many churches preach things about Paul? So many years ago, Pastor Charles and Pastor Ketch took, they went back through our, how many years ago was that? The believers classes that we had taught years ago, they taught it from church. Because these are the things that are going to establish you as a child of God. Can you say amen, church? Listen. So what did I tell you? It's not gotten by study. They are professors of historical theology. They are professors of uh, archaeological theology who don't know the Bible. In fact, it will surprise you that some of them are not even Christians. Some of them. They studied archaeology. They studied history. Some of them have met Christ while studying the Bible I know a number of people who became converted in the process. So somebody can have good brain knowledge, but when they read the Bible, without this spirit, the Bible is a closed book to you. The word of God is closed. You will not see things. You will not. And you could be a Christian if you don't ask God for this. You will read your Bible. You will read these things, but there's a level to which you will get. Let me ask you. When you are in school, or for those of you still in school, you know those guys whose GPs are like 4.8? Maybe people like Pastor, 4.8, 4.9. Those first class students. You You know them. You know them now. Don't look at me like that. Some of them come to class, they fold their notebooks. In fact, some of them, if you see them, they appear very unserious. They fold their notebooks, put it in their back pocket. Just come to class. They will, take, they will copy notes. <laughs> they, 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 they will co- Sometimes they don't even come to class. Some, they have been, listen, remember this, this spirit of wisdom is a gift. Say gift. You see, somebody who reads for one hour and sits for the exam and gets 100%. Another person who, sits, who, who, who reads the same content for eight hours, sits for the exam, sits for the exam and fails. Is there a difference? There's a difference. Based on this hypothesis, the first guy has something going for him. He has an aided gift. Probably an eidetic memory. So that once he reads his book, it has stayed. You know there are people like that. That gift was given to him by who? It's a divine gift. Some form of a divine gift. 
another person will read. There are people who made 2 1. It was almost like, Lord, let my people go. They, 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 they read and read and read and read. They dragged with the lecturer every one mark. The other people are just strolling to class. In university, everybody has to read, though. That's the realization. But some will read for 10 hours, irony. Some will read for one hour. They are ready for exam. They sit the exam, sit down in the exam. They, they submit. Result comes out. A, A, A. Ah, ah. This guy, he get juju. He don't get juju, he get gift. He has something going for him that accelerates and aids his understanding. The spirit of wisdom and revelation that God gives is compatible like that. It's just like that. He gives you the ability such that when you have that gift, and he gives it to you, it's available to every child of God. When you open the word of God, truth begins to jump out at you. It just begins to dance. There is this light that forensic people use if they're investigating a crime scene. It's called luminol. It's like a stick. It's similar to what security people use in the night. They wave it, and you see some kind of greenish, yellowish light coming. If there's been a crime in a place and there was blood splattered, and the offender cleaned the place very well, but they know that that's the crime scene, what they do sometimes, the crime detectives do, is that they come with all forms of gadgets. They spray some things, put up the light, and they bring the luminol. They put on that light. No matter how, how, how hard you try to conceal that crime, once that luminol comes on, what happens? Every splatter of blood, the one you thought you cleaned, and the one that touched the wall 10 inches away that you didn't know, it just brightens up. You just begin to see things. That is what this spirit does for you. Because once the eyes of your eye understanding are enlightened, you begin to see and you begin to know. Can somebody say amen today? Amen. Are you following me today? So this is what God does, and this is what he gives to us. Now, this gift, let me still press this, is comparable to the gift of wisdom that God gave Solomon. You see, what we have in the New Testament, many times if you go to the Old Testament, there's already a foreshadowing of it. Now, many of us know the story of, uh, who did I say now? Solomon. Look with me at 1 Kings 3, 5 to 9. 1 Kings 3, 5 to 9. So did I tell you that it is comparable to the gift of wisdom God gave Solomon? Good. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, first. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, Ask, what shall I give you? If God tells you, ask anything, you know you have to answer carefully. But now look at verse 9 to 12. He says, Solomon is speaking, Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Asked for what? An understanding heart to judge. Verse 11. Then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing and have not asked for long life for yourself, nor have asked for riches for yourself, nor have asked for life of your, the life of your enemies, but have asked for un for yourself understanding to discern justice, verse 12, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there, will, so that there has not been any like you before you, nor shall anyone like you arise, like anyone like you arise after you. Now I want you to notice this. Write 2 Chronicles 1, 10 to 12 down. This same episode is repeated in Chronicles. And the chronicler says that Solomon asked for wisdom. Say wisdom. Please speak out loud. Say wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge. And the Bible tells us in that text that God gave him wisdom and knowledge. What did Paul pray for? 
the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the... Are you beginning to see a pattern here? Are you beginning to see a similarity? Solomon, God meets up with Solomon and says, gives him a carte blanche. Ask me anything. Ah. God tells you, ask anything. Solomon could have asked for money. Solomon could have asked for riches. He could have asked for the life of his enemies. He could have asked for peace. But he said, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. That's in Chronicles. In 1 Kings, look at how he puts it. He calls that wisdom and knowledge an understanding heart. That God may give unto you the spirit of, let's go again, wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your the eyes of your understanding. That word understanding could also be rendered, and it's so in most translations, the eyes of your heart. Solomon prayed for an understanding heart. Why? How do you access wisdom and knowledge? If God is giving you wisdom and knowledge, what part of you is God giving wisdom and knowledge to? Your heart. And that word understanding heart is very interesting. The word understanding, you know what this is, what it is? It is a hearing heart. Isn't that interesting? A hear, you say, God, give me a heart that hears, or give me a heart that perceives, 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 because the doorway into so many spiritual things is your heart, is perception. It is hearing and it is seeing. In fact, hearing and seeing go together. What you hear, you see. As I'm talking now, you are hearing words. Am I correct? But if you observe, something's going on in your mind. Anything that I say that is picturesque, what happens? Your mind interprets the words you've heard in visual form. You know why? We are visual beings. That's why children learn faster with visual than with just talking to them. We are the teachers. Can, they, can, can, I be corpor, can I be corroborated on that? So that's what he asked for. Notice Solomon did not ask for the life of his enemies. He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for riches. Let me take you back to Paul's prayers. Do you observe that in all of Paul's prayers, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, Philippians 1, Colossians 1, Thess Thessalonians, in none of those prayers did Paul say, God... Give them money. God, give them increase. God, give them healing. He didn't pray for that. He prayed for what decodes those things. You didn't get it. The same way Solomon didn't was, was wise. He didn't ask for the life of his enemies. He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for honor. He asked for wisdom and God then told him, because you have prioritized wisdom, behold, I have given you this wisdom and the things you have not asked for, I have also given them to you. In other words, all these things that you have not asked for, I have given them to you in this wisdom that I have given to you. That's why Solomon would tell us later in, 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 in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, Get, that word get is a Hebrew word that implies acquisition. Acquire wisdom and in all your acquisition, acquire understanding. The priority was wisdom. Come to the New Testament. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. When I have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, then the eyes of my understanding are enlightened. I already see what belongs to me. I see healing is mine. I see provision is mine. I see direction is mine. I see babies are mine. I see breakthroughs are mine. All those things answer to the spirit of wisdom and revelation. It's like the Chinese proverb. Instead of giving you fish and fish today, fish tomorrow, I would rather give you the means through which you can catch your own fish. That is what the spirit of wisdom and revelation does. Amen, church. Amen. So this wisdom, like I said, is a gift from God. Solomon asked for it, and God gave it to him. When you receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation, listen, you will know what other people don't know. 
you will see what other people have not seen and do not see. Where others see impossibilities, you will see possibilities. I'll say that again. When you receive this wisdom, you will know what others don't know. You will see what others don't see. Where others see impossibilities, you will see possibilities. Can you say a good amen? Can you say amen? All right, so that's the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The little time I have left, let me go to the next part and just introduce that and leave you where I can, which is a prayer for enlightenment. So what's the first one did I, what first, what's the first one I said? The spirit of what? Wisdom, talk to me, church. The spirit of what? Wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Then the second one, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. This is a prayer for enlightenment, and it's closely linked with the first one. So that word enlightened is the word that means, listen, to function as a source of light. To function as a source of light. To shine. To cause to be illumined or illumined. To cause to be illumined. To function as a source of light, to shine. It's a Greek word, fortizo, where we get the word photo from. Fortizo, all right? And we all know that in the taking of a picture with a photo lens, light is involved, okay? Uh, it is used to describe or in reference, it is used in reference to the inner life or transcendent matters uh, and thus to enlighten. So it's used to refer to illumination on deep matters. Now, I want us to look at that prayer again, verse 18. Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, I want you to notice the nature, write this down, the nature of enlightenment. The nature of enlightenment. So, he's praying, in essence, that they have that when they receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of Christ, they will have eyes that see. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. I want you to notice what Paul did not pray. He did not pray that the word of God would be enlightened. Let me ask you. When you pray for, for, let's say you are praying for a service, it is right and proper to pray that the word of God will be opened and enlightened. The Bible says in Psalm 119 verse 130 that the entrance of your word, what does it bring? It brings light. And that word light in the Septuagint is the same word for tizo here. The entrance, or like another version says, the unfolding of your word. I like to think of the word of God like a shirt that is folded. Many people fold their clothes. But question, do you wear clothes that are folded? Who wears clothes that are folded? F clothes, you wear your clothes in a folded state. So it means your clothes are folded to be what? Unfolded in order to wait. And that's what the word of God is. The word of God is given to us in a folded state. But the entrance, for it to work in your life, it has to be what? Unfolded. So it is a valid prayer that, Lord, as your word is coming forth, let it emit glorious light into the hearts of the hearers in Jesus' name. Amen. That's correct. But that is not Paul's prayer here. Paul prayed rather that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. That is, your eyes may have light. When a person is blind, or they tell us these days to call them visually impaired, what is the major problem that they have? Let me ask you, if a blind man comes into this place with all this radiant light, will he see anything? Why? Why? The problem is not is that the problem is not that he's is, is, is not that he's not in a realm of light. He's in a realm of light, but he does not have light to see light. 
That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 36, for with you is the fountain of light. And in your light, we shall see light. So it takes light to have illuminated eyes to see. Go back to the illustration of the, of the apocalypse I gave, right? The unveiling. Remember, revelation means what? Apocalypto, to remove a veil. So now we have the banner behind this, behind this veil or this covering. If this covering is removed, who are those who will see what is behind it? Those who have eyes to see or those who have light in their eyes. In other words, though the covering is off, if a person is visually impaired, will they see it? They will not. You can see the importance of Paul's prayer. That God is praying that our eyes will be flooded with heavenly light so that what God has made known to us but in the apocalypse, in the unveiling, we will see what has been unveiled. Because until you see it, you cannot get into it. Anybody following me, church? So he's not praying that God let them see the light in the world. When Jesus on the road of Emmaus, let me illustrate it with this. And he met those people and they were talking, they were talking, they were talking, they were talking. There were two things that Jesus opened. Or two things that opened. Number one, he opened the scriptures. Then the Bible also says he opened their minds to comprehend the scriptures. If we want the word of God to work in the lives of people, these two things must be open. The word of God must be open and then the minds or the eyes of the people must be open. In another place in that same text, it tells us that Jesus was before them and, and all of a sudden their eyes were opened and they saw him and he vanished. Are you following me, church? So Paul is praying that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened. Write this down. This is a prayer for the reader or for the hearer. For light to come into their eyes. Like I've said, something may be unveiled, but if the eyes are closed or they are impaired and cannot see, then what has been unveiled will still not be visible to them. Will still not be visible. So what has God done in this powerful prayer? He has shown us that in Christ, he has given us an unveiling. He has revealed what Christ has done for us. And now in order for us to see it, what is he doing? He has given us a spirit that is compatible with that revelation. And then in that spirit, he's helping our eyes so that they can see. Remember Jesus said in a place, blessed are your eyes that they do what? That they see these things. He's not talking of your physical eyes. He's talking of your spiritual eyes. Now, let us look at this briefly. The need for enlightenment. Because somebody is asking, Pastor Chola, why do we need to pray that the eyes of understanding be enlightened? Ah, why? We have born again. We have light. We have all of these things. Well, firstly, we need to be enlightened because of darkness. The past darkness the past darkness, past darkness, sorry, and spiritual impairment. How many of you know the story of Adam and Eve's fall? You remember the story? In Genesis chapter 3, I think it's verse 5, the Bible tells us that uh, Satan met them, and the serpent said unto the woman, has God said you shall not eat of the trees of this, the fruit of these uh, of this tree. And she said, yes, God said, don't even touch it. And Satan said, no. The serpent said, no. Uh, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in that day that you eat of it, what did he promise them? Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Now when you get to verse 7, actually their eyes were opened. Look at verse 7. Put up verse 7 kindly. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they, what's the next word? New. But here's the thing. What were their eyes opened to? Their eyes were opened. You know, when we use open eye today, is it a good thing? That person, I, I, I open, or her eye open, tear, reach back. When you say that, you say that person is an obolobo. Is it bad? But do you know this is when darkness started to reign? 
It's interesting in Europe, there was a time in Europe called the Enlightenment. Between, between uh, the 18th century and the 20th century, 17 something to 19 something. Uh, no, 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 no. 16 to 18, yes. It's very interesting that it's in that Enlightenment period that all kinds of liberal ideologies were given birth unto. That's why Jesus said, take heed, lest the light, let the light in you is not darkness. Because what man propagates as open eye see is actually what? Darkness. So the moment Adam and Eve sinned against God, one of the first place spiritual death manifested was in the realm of their knowledge. They became spiritually impaired. Their eyes were opened to the sense realm, to sin and corruption. And in that open eye, their eyes became what? Closed to spiritual reality. When we get born again, God saves us instantly by his spirit in our spirits. But then in salvation, God begins to reclaim the land that we lost when we fell. And that happens in our soul through the renewing of our minds. So even though you're born again, the fact that you're born again does not mean automatically that the eyes of your understanding are enlightened to spiritual truth. That's why you still struggle with spiritual truth. Am I correct? So Paul says, prayed, Paul prayed that the eyes of your understanding may now be opened up, that you can now begin to see. You begin to see. Look at Titus 3, verse 3. Titus 3. It says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Because sin took its toll on man totally, spirit, soul, and in his body. And in man's soul, foolishness, deception. Do you know that a man outside Christ has a natural flair for deception? Have you found people that it is easy to deceive them? Yes, it's an effect of sin. But when you get born again and God begins to enlighten your eyes, things begin to change. We also have, write this down, we also have the danger of walking in darkness. The danger of walking in darkness. This is why the eyes of understanding need to be enlightened. Ephesians 4, 17 to 18. This is the same book of Ephesians where Paul prayed that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened. Look at these verses. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer, say no longer, say it out loud, no longer, walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, verse 18, having their understanding what? Darkened. Now, look at what Paul is saying here. He's saying, don't walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. So that's a caution. Why is he saying don't walk as they walk? Because it is possible for you to walk as they walk. He now gives you the characteristics of these people. Number one, he says they are in the futility or emptiness of their mind. Verse 18, their understanding is, is what? Darkened. So what is Paul telling me? That I as a saint, I am not meant to walk with, an, with a darkened understanding. So what is the cure for me not to walk in a darkened understanding? If he says don't walk in a darkened understanding, do you realize that it is possible to walk with a darkened understanding? Listen. It is dangerous to live in this world without illumination. Without spiritual light. Because this world is in a state of spiritual darkness. And until this world comes to an end, until Jesus Christ comes, spiritual darkness will still be on this world, in this earth. As long as Satan is still the God of this world, right? Right? What does the Bible say? 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, That the God of this age has blinded. That is his work. There is darkness in the world. So the only guarantee you have not to be overpowered by the darkness is for you to have light. 
Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. If you don't believe this world is in darkness, then you are not here. Look at our political landscape in Nigeria. You think it is just physical? No, talk to me. You think it's just physical? Look at what is going on in the world, even with things like gay agenda and all these liberal thoughts. You think there's no darkness in the world? There is darkness. The only cure you have is to have your own light. And one of the places that light has to come is by having your eyes of understanding enlightened so that revelation knowledge becomes the touch light, becomes the beam light through which you walk, through which you go, and you see possibilities. When things are going south for people, you don't see the way they are seen because your eyes are opened up to a different set of realities. You are seeing what they cannot see. You are like Elisha. Other people are like Gehazi. And the house of Elisha was, was surrounded with hundreds and probably thousands, a garrison of soldiers. And Elisha, uh, uh, Gehazi, looks out and he sees only the soldiers and he says, Master, Master, we are done for. What shall we do? But Elisha, who could see with the eyes of the Spirit, his eyes were opened to another layer of truth and reality, said, Lord, open this boy's eyes. Open him. Open his eyes that he may see. I personally believe that at that time, the Bible doesn't tell us that God literally opened Elisha's eyes. But Elisha was accustomed to the realm of the spirit and by knowledge, he knew that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. So he could see in the spirit. He could perceive what other people could not perceive because his eyes were opened to that. And in this day and in this age, this is why this prayer is very important for you to pray so that you can see and you can perceive spiritual truth, spiritual realities, and spiritual possibilities. Can you say amen? I said, can you say amen, church? Can you say amen? Well, let me end there. Do I just lift you up your hands and thank God for his word? Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. The eyes of our understanding are enlightened. We know, we know the hope to which we are called. We know the riches of the glory of the us, of our inheritance as saints. Thank you, Father, that through your light we walk through darkness. For the light shines and the darkness does not comprehend it. Thank you, Father. We give you glory. We give you praise. Oh, blessed be your name. I'd like us to pray this prayer as we end. In the last few minutes, I want us to pray this prayer. Can you put Ephesians 1 up? Ephesians chapter 1, starting from verse 17 to 23. Can you put it up? And let us pray it all together. When you see, when you see uh, uh, our, the, uh, the pronouns, make them personal. So when he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, say the God of my Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, you give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. So personalize it and so forth. So let's put it up. Can we reduce the music a bit? And let's all pray it out loud. I want you, as the screen comes up, let's pray it out together. Lift your hands up and let it be a desire coming out from the depth of your heart unto God. So want to go. Christ, the Father of glory. You give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, that I may know what is the hope of my calling, what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in me as a saint, what is the exceeding greatness of your power toward me who believe, according to the working of your mighty power, which you worked in Christ, when you raised him from the dead, and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And you will put all things under his feet, and you gave him to be head over all things to the church, the church which is your body, the fullness of him 
who fills all in all, and, and, and I am a part of that fullness. Let's just pray. Let's just pray about this. Pray it in, for one minute. Pray it in the spirit. Pray it in your understanding. Thank you, Father. We receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Thank you, Lord. Our eyes, the eyes of our heart are opened, Father, flooded with light. We begin to see heavenly truths. We begin to see realities in your word. We begin to see what you have accomplished for us. We begin to receive what you intend to do for us. Thank you, Father. We begin to see possibilities. Where people see doors shut, we see open doors. Where people see impossibilities, we see possibilities. Thank you for realities of truth. Real, spiritual realities opened up to us. Spiritual things becoming more real to us than physical things, than natural things. Thank you, Father. Thank you for, as we pray these prayers, progressively, steadily, incrementally, we'll appreciate in our spiritual awareness and understanding. We give you praise and we give you glory. We thank you for all that which Christ procured for us in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection will be a palpable reality in our lives and will walk in the fullness and in the reality of it. To you be all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Father.